In many ways, tonight's event for me brings a strong sense of deja vu. CIS started in the wake of the Whitlam years, where, in recent history, government had its first big growth spurt. The start of that period was around 24% of GDP. Now it's 50%. Maybe I've been wasting my time all these years, but I don't think so. The tidal flow of government is overwhelming. Yes, there have been positive reforms, and we are a much richer and in some ways freer place, though there are worrying signs on that front, which I think we know about. We certainly had something to do with that successful reform period. However, there seems to be a fault in the way modern democracies function, with what I would call a political market being rigged to one side, namely the supply side. Things could have been far worse, as the current European situation shows. I'm sure we have played a role in fending off that fate as well. But the signs are not good right now, particularly with this lengthy election campaign, which is not a campaign, threatening to splash cash in all directions. Target 30 is about bringing to the problem the skills and ideas that we have developed over a long period to start to turn things around. It won't be easy. As our friend and Benighton lecturer of a few years ago, P.J. O'Rourke said, the mystery about government is not how it works, but how to make it stop. <laughs> that's, that's a mystery we intend to solve, at least give it a shot anyway, and we need your help, and there'll be more about that later. Tonight we have three speakers. David Murray was chairman of the Australian Government Future Fund Board of Guardians, serving between 2006 and 2012, and chair of the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds. Prior to his appointment to the Future Fund, he was the chief executive officer of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia between 92 and 2005, which I don't think anybody really <laughs> is reminding of. Uh, and he, and he, and he uh, presided over such a great period of growth for that organisation. Morris Newman, until March 2012, was the chairman of the ABC, as well as former chair of the board of the Australian Stock Exchange. He was Chancellor of Macquarie University until 2008. And what's interesting, from this, point of the, uh, from this organisation's point of view, he was on the founding board of the centre and our second chairman, serving for nine years uh, following Neville Kennard. Simon Cowan is the lead author of the Target 30 launch document, which you all have. He's a research fellow in the economics program and, amongst other things, will be working on government industry policy and regulation. Prior to joining CIS, he practised corporate law at a top-tier law firm in Sydney and London, and after that joined the New South Wales Government in their industry division. David will speak first, to be followed by Simon, and then we're going to have the questions and answers, and then Morris will then give concluding remarks in his usual, usual forthright way, and the Centre's Chairman Michael Darling will thank the speakers on behalf of us all. Quite a nice round of drinks and canapes, repeating what we've already had, I guess. Thanks to Macquarie, will follow. Um, we've had a lot of very supportive messages, uh, emails and the like since we first announced what we were doing. 3.30 this afternoon, I received this one, and I'll read it to you. <clears throat> Greg, I noticed in the AFR that the CIS has launched a campaign to get government spending from 35 to 30% of GDP. We're, exactly, we're on exactly that track with government expenses peaking in 2010 at 35% of GDP and on track to hit 30% by 2016, including absorbing the effects of our recession and the Christchurch earthquake. I am telling some Aussie business audiences about this next week. We are halfway there, and I'm increasingly confident about reaching 30, even the, with an election next year. This is important. Public consensus, consensus is sufficiently strong to prevent the major parties starting a bidding war, so it can be done. Regards, Bill English, Minister of Finance, New Zealand. Uh, and here's another one uh, going from uh, Wellington right the way to Perth, or with Canberra in the middle, I guess, from Senator D Dean Smith, a uh, Liberal Party senator from Western Australia. He wrote, I am adding my voice to this very worthy and urgent policy objective. I do not believe it is well understood enough across our community that excessive government spending crowds out innovation, personal responsibility and liberty in our country. Your campaign will be an important first step in holding future governments to account on this critical policy issue. I wholeheartedly agree with your comments that smaller governments can uh, increase economic growth and strengthen social and family bonds. And before I finish, I'll give you some more PJ O'Rourke. Feeling good about government is like looking on the bright side of any catastrophe. <laughs> when you quit looking on the bright side, the catastrophe is still there. Uh, please welcome David Murray. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Greg, and sincere thanks for the opportunity to support this timely initiative by the CIS. 
I want you to recall the large red sign at the wrong entrance to the motorway. It says, go back wrong way. This describes the Australian economy and its public finances today. Having been through the early stages of the global financial crisis and watching the policy errors of those that created it, Australia has a chance of a lifetime to redirect its policy before it's too late. Turning things round will, however, require a degree of transparency and honesty of debate that we do not see today. In time, this will call for a clearer understanding of the Australian culture and why it is able to drift in what Professor Garneau has called the great complacency. A culture in which the Australian people do not hold their, elect their electoral representatives to account and the representatives are not prepared to be held to account. The good news is that things can be turned around if we have these things. A shared understanding of what has actually happened in the world. Secondly, the truth about the Australian economy and its finances. And lastly, the general shape of a solution. Let me address these and start with what has happened in the world and where we are now in the unfolding of the global financial crisis. I say unfolding because it is by no means over. Um, you, you'll note that at the start of the crisis, uh, everything was attributable to banks. The issue was that if governments run loose fiscal and monetary policy for an extended time, the clear beneficiary as businesses in the totality of the system is banks. Uh, their business grows at an unprecedented rate. Asset prices grow no matter what. Any deal can be done, any commission earned. The fact is that if the government litters the pavement with dollar bills, some people will pick them up. And they did. And of course, there were some questionable practices in what happened, but that does not change the fact Make no mistake, the crisis was caused by loose fiscal and monetary policy over an extended period in the world's two largest economies, the United States and the European Union. The excessive financial leverage and asset price distortions caused by this policy created a crisis of proportions not seen since the 1930s, requiring an immensely long process of painful resolution a process which has hardly began, begun, if at all. At this point, over five years in, both Europe and the United States have higher government debt than in 2006, approaching $17 trillion in the United States alone. Both economies are in political deadlock over the degree of fiscal austerity necessary to work towards a longer-term sustainable solution. In fact, the process of offering debt-funded entitlements to attract votes does not appear to have been challenged very seriously at all. The consequence of political inaction has been to leave the response to central banks to stimulate growth with aggressive and unconventional monetary policy. This in turn has led to a currency war recently enjoined by Japan. It's hard to predict the outcome of a currency race to the bottom. I mean, one should... It's easy in, in, in theory, that is, the worst, worst managed economy should hit the bottom first. But this is about stimulating short-term growth whilst avoiding the hard fiscal decisions needed for <coughs> sustainable longer-term growth. So let me turn to the truth about Australia's position. I learned in relation to competition and business strategy that a firm should never get itself into position whether it is neither able to attack in a competitive sense nor defend itself. And that's where Australia is headed. Australia's cost structure is simply too high, largely driven by high wages at a time when productivity improvement is weak. Although unemployment appears low, wages are growing at close to 4% per annum, but total hours, well, unemployment is low, wages are growing at close to 4% per annum, but total hours worked in the economy are falling. The growth rate of hours worked is falling. So labour productivity is actually falling. 
Since labour generally accounts for most business costs, generally we, we say two thirds, the outlook for employment is also weakening. The European-esque process of continuously increasing regulation reduces productivity by adding steps to work processes rather than taking steps out. We know if you target productivity in business, you redesign work to remove steps from work processes. At the same time, both the budget and current account are in structural deficit, meaning that the deficits cannot be removed without a structural change in the economy and the serious policy changes needed to affect it. In the case of the budget, um, as the CIS has pointed out, the Commonwealth outlays which are the most challenging to address for politicians, namely welfare, education and health, <coughs> increased from 20% of outlays in 71 to 58% in 2011. Welfare spending is $132 billion. Without some tough decisions, these expenditures will remain a rising fixed cost, detached from the fortunes of the economy, which is subject to changes in commodity prices, world growth patterns and other exogenous factors. Hence, we already have an operating leverage problem in the budget. We know in business that an operating leverage problem, go down to the bank and talk about it and they will tell you, if you have that, you can have less debt. So after 21 years of continuous growth and the best terms of trade in 150 years, Australia has both structural budget and current account deficits, not a good result. Dependency on foreign capital is the main driver of the current account deficit, but even so, the trade balance has rarely been positive, notwithstanding the terms of trade boom. In short, Australia must refinance its net payments of dividends and interest to foreigners each year. This amounts to some 40 billion per annum and results from Australia's high level of net foreign liabilities, some 57% of GDP, a number which is not to be repeated in Canberra. The combination of structural deficits, high operating leverage and high net foreign liabilities means Australia cannot match the level, even the prudent level, of government debt of some other nations. Both the UK and the USA, by contrast, have high net, pri sorry, high net foreign assets in the private sector, offsetting government debt, and even though that, that government debt is excessively high. But Australia does not have private sector net foreign assets. Going into the crisis, Australia's critical asset was the absence of Commonwealth debt and its AAA rating. I recall at the time discussing in Canberra the need for the government to get around the world and sell that position as hard as possible because of the funding pressure on the banks from outside Australia. Why did I do that? Because I read Boris Shedvin's book about Australia in the Great Depression and how Australia went within £10 million pounds of outright default in 1932 and the work that the government and its officials of the day had to do to scratch around the world and reassure people that Australia would always repay its debts. But gross debt is now approaching $300 billion, or about 18% of GDP, on the top of net private sector liabilities. Note that the net debt of 9% of GDP is not the relevant number because bondholders do not have a right of set-off against other government assets. In the event that bondholders want to redeem their bonds, and they must wait to do so, they know that a government can pledge or run down its assets, hence a structural deficit raises their level of risk. Now the majority of this debt, about 80%, is held by foreigners. Bear in mind that the 200 plus percent of GDP, GDP debt of the Japanese government is not held by any foreigners. But in Australia's case, 80% of the debt is held by foreigners. That means that our spending decisions, including our political promises, are increasingly in the hands of others and the rating agencies. 
yet the AAA rating is looking increasingly vulnerable and any downgrade would flow onto the states, the banks and corporations generally, putting further pressure on financing the current account deficit and the budget through rising interest rates. What is not discussed is the vulnerability of very high foreign liabilities and the weakness in the rating, <coughs> namely the relationship between external debt and current account receipts. This is how the rating agencies look at it. Australia falls well outside the scores of the median AAA rated median of the AAA rated countries. For example, the rating agency's measure of external debt as a percentage of current account receipts uh, is about 100% for the medium, tri median AAA rated country, but over 200% for Australia and the median G7 country, which has got some pretty awful players in it. Ultimately, with a structural current account deficit, the Australian dollar will not be a classical safe haven currency. With recent confirmation that the budget will remain in deficit, some suggestions that foreign buying of CGS has slowed and a marked slowdown in mining investment, it is time to reassess policy. In thinking about a solution, <laughs> my third point, the solution, uh, it's helpful to reflect on government spending trends. In general, governments have increased spending on things that are nice, but has decreased spending on things that are valuable. Put another way, they have increased consumption-related expenditures and decreased investment-related spending. Now, what, why is this important? Contrary to some of the derogatory marks made about politics earlier, I'm a great believer that we operate in one system, a system that has people and government and a private sector and a public sector. It's how we get those working in harmony that matters. So the solution lies in both reducing overall government spending but increasing the proportion of investment related spending. As the CIS program will show, consumption related expenditure eventually becomes a drag on the economy. But there are areas in which government is better... Pl oh, we're at Macquarie, I shouldn't say this. The government is better placed to invest than the private sector. Normally in infrastructure where there are positive spillover effects and externalities arising from the public sector's capacity to pool risks. Uh, in a book written by the Harvard Business School about the future of capitalism, in the conclusion they, uh, th they concluded that the problem with governments is they've abandoned their traditional role in a capitalist system. To achieve the overall outcome and the right balance requires government to confront productivity improvement in the economy generally and in its own activities. This has been done elsewhere to, by facing up to a far more efficient conduct of health, education and other services in ways we have not been willing to accept. Much is made of the Scandinavian countries and the things that they've done. But the things that they've done have been achieved against the background that they were in horrible difficulty in the first place. <coughs> difficulty, I suppose, characterised by a marginal tax rate on business of 100%. And to get out of that problem... Uh, where they still believe in a higher level of government spending, they have subjected every area of government expenditure to contestability. School voucher systems, hospitals run by the best people at running hospitals, you name it, they have made everything contestable. At the same time, to the extent that they spend their money on public goods, Thomas the Tank Engine, all the usual stuff, uh, they make sure that people realise that it works efficiently so they get some acceptance for what they're doing. But it is not possible um, for, for us to say what they've done is necessarily correct because their starting position was so weak. In respect to infrastructure, there must be publicly transparent processes 
for project ranking and selection based on standards for cost-benefit analysis and publication of the results. No different to the accounting standards we all live with. This would not be unique. Just recently, Norway published its uh, review done last year, its, its review done by a judge, of uh, its public assumptions for cost-benefit analysis uh, which must be used in all project analysis. And they published uh, a critique of whether any of those should change or not. So this approach, together with trading, the trading of wage rises for tangible productivity improvement and reduction of the regulatory bur burden would bring things around more quickly than most appreciate. It does, however, call for a dose of reality. Recent suggestions that we could use our AAA rating and the historical low cost of debt in the world today to finance large investment in infrastructure would, without offsetting adjustments, be a cargo cult experiment with the potential to leave us even more exposed. My view about this is not only that we operate in one system, uh, private and public sector, but the significant issue is, is the people or the human system that we operate, not necessarily the technical system. And that means that um, we need a general wake-up call that our situation is not what we think it is, but that needs to be part of a cultural shift in which we reject spin, stop copying Europe, fight for transparency, hold our politicians accountable and elect only those who want to be accountable. We must discuss the risks to our democracy and rule of law that come from this complacency. It's pretty sad when a shadow attorney general can stand up and say that they are going to review all Commonwealth laws to remove the reversion of onus of proof in any area where it occurs in the law. That is pretty sad. Well, we're lucky because we can turn this around, but remember the sign on the motorway. It calls for early and decisive posturing, and I've no doubt that the CIS project will make an extraordinarily valuable contribution. Thanks very much. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the lead author of the foundation document for Target 30, and my role tonight is to take you through some of the specifics of Target 30 and what it might mean for Australia. As David outlined, we've come through a period of extraordinary economic growth in this country, with sustained increases of GDP stretching back for decades. Yet in spite of these unique circumstances, the size of government in Australia has grown and grown and grown. Spending across all three levels of government has increased at an average rate of more than 4% per year since 1972. And today, as has already been outlined, the government rakes in more than a third of everything the country produces. Governments have been spending in bad times, trying to buy their way out of recessions. And governments have been spending in good times to spread the benefits of the boom. And across the world, decades of these misguided policies have created bloated governments and societies in crisis. But Target 30 is not about what we've done wrong in the past. Target 30 is about the future. And in the future, Australia is facing substantial challenges from an ageing population, from rising healthcare costs and expected slower economic growth. These conditions mean that government could exceed 50% of GDP by 2050, burdening future generations with higher taxes, higher debts and a further breakdown in society. The CIS has launched the Target 30 campaign to try and break these trends and to prepare Australia to meet these future challenges. Target 30 promotes the benefits of smaller government and aims to reduce government spending to less than 30% of GDP in the next 10 years. The initial research in Target 30 will focus on health, welfare and education because together these areas make up more than 60% of government budgets. And Target 30 will focus on ways that these essential services can be delivered efficiently and effectively 
while reducing some of the wasteful spending. And there's a lot of wasteful spending. Currently, government spends approximately $60 billion a year more than it should. Without Target 30, governments could be wasting $150 billion a year by 2021. We cannot and should not meekly accept that future tax rises are inevitable because of claims that government doesn't have enough money to meet its basic obligations. Government spends about half a trillion dollars a year and many spending programs are either completely unnecessary or very poorly designed. The failures of government in areas such as defence and infrastructure should, not, should be put down to incompetence, not to underfunding. However, the forces of big government marshalled against us are enormous. Government spending has created a legion of vested interests with incentives to vote for even greater largesse. We estimated that nearly half of all voters in the 2010 elections were receiving the majority, if not all, of their income directly from the government. And these difficulties in reducing spending are why Target 30 is proposing practical and achievable targets for reducing government spending. It's a target that can be met just by holding spending constant in per capita terms. It is a compromise between what is economically ideal and what is realistic. Subsequent papers in the Target 30 campaign will deal in a lot more detail with specific ways to cut spending, but there are some practical steps that we can take right now that will put us on the right track to meeting this target. And a good starting point for the next government is an audit of all existing government programs and departments to determine what programs are really necessary and what programs are actually effective in meeting, in meeting people's needs. Obvious areas of waste and inefficiency should be cut immediately. This includes the billions that's paid in corporate welfare to foreign car makers and others, and the massive duplication of functions at the state and Commonwealth level. To meet the challenges of an ageing population, we must spur improvements in public sector efficiency and productivity, especially in aged care and in hospitals. We need to encourage competition and let consumers make meaningful choices through the use of things like user charges and by being much more explicit about the true cost of government subsidies in areas such as public transport and pharmaceutical benefits. We must also focus on public sector workforce productivity by appropriately rewarding good performers but making it easier to remove poor performers. We can create a competitive advantage for our economy by cutting red tape and government wheel spinning. Reducing welfare churn alone would go a long way towards meeting a Target 30 goal. One of the things that you can see from tonight and from our, the documents we've prepared is that Target 30 is not an austerity campaign. It's not a scare campaign. It won't propose abolishing welfare or any radical reforms like that, and it's not about punishing the poor. What it's about is asking Australians to stop demanding more and more services from the government that they would like but don't want to pay for, and start focusing more on things that we really need. We at the CIS are excited to bring the Target 30 campaign to you, and we hope that you'll add your voice to the fight for smaller government. Because as Greg said, smaller government means a bigger future for us all. Uh, David Murray said something about electing representatives who would uh, do something about all this. I'll tell you what, it's got nothing whatever to do with that. The representatives who we vote for are chosen by the factions and the political parties. And if they don't go along with the faction, it doesn't matter what the hell they think about this. Sorry to say that, but uh, that's the fact. There's a set of beliefs that you can be Labour or Liberal, left or right, faction A, faction B, and all that's allowed to cloud the discussion rather than a, a discussion about value and merit and progress and prosperity. Morris, would anything to add to that? Um, I think what I, I would add to that is that Target 30 is not intended to be a political campaign. We're not targeting one side of politics or the other. 
Um, we think the ideas that we're talking about here are practical and achievable solutions for cutting waste. And, then, and they're designed to be able to take it by whatever government is in power. Um, obviously, there are some issues, I think, around some of the factionalism and, and the fact that, at the moment, politics seems to be so antagonistic. But what we've outlined in, in this paper and what David was talking about tonight are some serious challenges that will be confronting Australia as a society and the burdens that are, we're putting on future generations. And I think that's a bipartisan issue. Um, and once we get past this election campaign of six, eight months or however long it is, um, hopefully we'll see some serious policy debate about some of these issues. Yeah, Simon, a question for you in your uh, numbering as to just how many departments, bureaucrats, how much government we actually have. Are you actually factoring in a number for all the allegedly non-government organisations which various levels of government subsidise to the hilt to indirectly provide goods and services? Um, that's a good question and it's certainly something that, that we're looking at. Um, one of the, the real challenges that we found in, in preparing Target 30 is that it's very difficult to get an accurate measure of how big government really is. Um, one of the things that we noticed in, in various policy areas is that uh, people don't actually know how many programs government have. They don't know how much government's spending. Um, and if you look at some of the figures produced by quite reputable organisations, there are variations of tens of billions of dollars in the amount that is spent by government. Um, one of the things that we are hoping to do as part of this campaign is really get down into some of the areas within the bigger departments where there is waste um, and duplication of programs. And, and that, I think, is one of the issues that you're, you're talking about. There is um, some duplication of programs across the private sector and the public sector. And to an extent, the public sector is crowding out a lot of the things the private sector would be doing anyway. Um, one of the benefits of smaller government, by removing government from that conversation, you allow the private sector to start taking over those functions again. Uh, do you intend to influence the corporate sector? I see a lot of calls in various sectors for welfare, and if you're in business, you are really on the outer if you speak out against it. So how, how and by corporate, I'm, it's not necessarily the large end of town, it can be even small business associations who seem to be jumping on the bandwagon of training and um, all sorts of other things, often even driven by the executive in small business associations, not all of them. But I think that's a very important area. I'm seeing a lot of growth in the belief that this is good and right in business to be calling for useless money to be spent in completely useless ways. And in business, you can't speak out against it without being sort of um, feeling that someone might come and get you in the middle of the night. David, would you like to... Um, well, I, I think the greatest service you can do in business to your community is run a business well. Uh, and that, if run well, it means that... Um, sorry. It's not the individual business people who are the problem, and it's not all business associations, but many business associations... Um, <coughs> the, ca the careerism of people who run the associations, they do not lead the businesses within that business to look to real, to policy that has long-term benefits for the, for the businesses and the country, they look to promoting to their members short-term handouts. Um, they also look to their own career so they can get more government money, they can have bigger empires within the association. It's yeah, a, it's was, a serious problem. I was coming to that. Mm. The, but you have to understand first that the greatest thing you can do for a community is to run a business well where the profit you make is reflected in the value you add to your customers and, I and in a development sense to your employees. Now that is often overlooked and clouded by the discussion of corporate social responsibility. Business associations can be easily captured by their secretariat uh, and they become commentators on everything but not much help to their own members. What has happened is that they've been given a huge carrot particularly in things like the training agenda, safety agendas and everything else, to actually turn themselves into businesses. And what this has done is to aid and abet the process of over-regulation. One example, 
there is a, um, an act in New South Wales called the Fines Act. And there is what's called the moiety provisions of the Fines Act, which go back to pre-King George VI or something, in which it's possible for a fine collected to be shared with somebody in the private sector who helped collect the fine. Not necessarily in a modern society, but there were, there were some arguments for it in the old days. <coughs> now, in the industrial law, if an organisation such as a bank is accused of allowing a safety incident to happen without due process, concern, procedure, then a, an action can be brought by a trade union to the employer uh, or a representative of work cover who are generally ex-trade unionists and the fine is shared between the Crown and the union. Now that is corrupt. That is corrupt. Now when we oppose that on those grounds, we find that one of the biggest business organisations in Australia had got in there before us arguing that they would help sort this through and help with redrafting, but it didn't go away. So you're right. Morris, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I think I agree with David. I mean, what you find is that uh, business associations tend to be captured, uh, usually by the lowest common denominator within the association, and also, of course, by government uh, and government regulators are always trying to get their influence uh, through these associations. Rent seeking uh, is alive and well. Uh, we see it in particular in, in environmental issues and in particular climate issues, uh, and especially in when it comes to <coughs> renewable energy. I mean, if we look at the carbon tax, it really is just the tip of the iceberg. The real cost is in subsidies which go to solar, wind, and other renewables, where in fact you have a wealth transfer from the poor to the rich. And yet this is sanctioned by government, uh, but it uh, obviously is uh, attractive to the companies who are concerned and who are able to influence government to lend the, uh, the, the, the taxpayers' uh, dollars, or not lend, give the taxpayers' dollars to these people. <coughs> so it's an issue. and. Uh, it's a part of what has been encouraged in our society for so long. My question it refers to uh, Mr. Burry's uh, comments about uh, uh, labour costs and productivity. <coughs> uh, he mentioned that uh, the high labour costs is decreasing uh, productivity. Uh, what productivity can be increased by two ways. One, of course, one by slashing wages and costs, and the other one is if someone has a good idea and and the savings to uh, implement that idea, you can, for a new machinery, uh, a worker can have an increased output. For example, a new machine, instead of one light bulb per hour, can produce 10,000 light bulbs per hour. Uh, that To get the savings, do you, one would need <coughs> uh, the government to be smaller, smaller government, so there will be more investment capital for the private sector to invest in such technology and so forth. Do you think Target 30 would be sufficient to, uh, in, in a way that the labour costs can increase and productivity can increase simultaneously? Is it sufficient at that level to increase both productivity and higher lo uh, labour costs at the same time? Well, th th that's the perfect outcome. And the, um, the only sustainable way of increasing labour costs is through higher productivity. What, in my experience, simply slashing costs has the opposite effect. Uh, whereas programs which increase the engagement of the workforce, increase the capacity and training of the workforce, and invest in continually upgrading the, the, the capital stock, keeping it within its useful life, not letting it waste, those programs seriously increase productivity, which is the only sustainable way of making wage rises. So that, but there are many impediments to that. Th there are no trade-offs in wage negotiations for 
tangible productivity improvement and the regulatory system keeps putting more impediments in the way of the capital deepening process that you talked about. The unfortunate thing is that if the currency falls, that capital deepening process gets harder. But we, we, we still have to pursue productivity improvement. And if I could just add to that from my perspective, two of the things that are, I think, important. One is that we really do need to focus on public sector workforce productivity because there are such large gains that can be made there. Um, and one of the biggest benefits from a program designed to smaller government is really to try and remove some of the restrictions and the red tape that is just crippling the public sector and the private sector as well. Um, by removing government from some of these functions, by, by stopping government from interfering in every step of the process, we allow the market to be to, to generate more productive outcomes. Um, and so certainly from our perspective, we think that Target 30 will have that effect and that benefit. Um, <coughs> John Stone, uh, the only regret I have about the uh, name of this uh, program is that it should have been Target 25. <laughs> 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 After all, about 70, I think, or 80, maybe been 80 years ago, uh, one of Australia's most distinguished economists, Colin Clark, actually said that um, he did not believe that any economy could, in the developed world, he didn't use those terms in those days, uh, could function efficiently at, uh, with, G with uh, expenditure uh, 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 more than 25% of GNP. He was one of the inventors of GNP, by the way. Now, um, that said, you would, of course, have to allow maybe 20 years, not 10 years, to achieve that objective. Um, i just say two other things. Um, first, uh, I think uh, David said, and I think Greg Lindsay may also have said originally, that uh, they believed that smaller government meant uh, uh, faster growth and there was better outcome for, uh, for uh, people's real incomes. I happen to agree with that, but I, I'd have to say that I think that just to say that is regarded by most people as a glib statement of belief or faith, if you like, uh, or even ideology, uh, but not uh, provable, so to speak. So I think uh, if this program is to be successful, <coughs> have to be uh, uh, very conscious of that um, deficiency or that gap in the argument, if you like, and point out and, and be able to develop programs accompanying it, showing why this is the case, in particular, of course, by cutting taxes. Uh, I mean, after all, uh, I, I understand with a big structural budget deficit, cutting tax is not necessarily the first thing you have to do, but it, isn't, it shouldn't be very far behind the first thing you have to do. My final point is to do with the matter of productivity has been raised by a couple of speakers, and David was replying to that a moment ago. The fact is, of course, that nothing significant can really be done about improving productivity until we deal with the uh, ball and chain around that's been around our neck for, since 1903, somewhat uh, reduced in weight in, the last, in uh, uh, under the last 20 or 30 years, although the weight is increasing once again now under Gillard's Fair Work Act, and that is the industrial relations system. Mm -hmm. The whole system of regulation is the most important single thing which is holding Australia back. Uh, and not only is it doing that, but it's also having the most appalling uh, distributional effects, if you like, because the people who are most hurt by it are people like Aboriginals, uh, uh, young people, who, and generally speaking, people without skills and education. They're the ones who cannot, because of uh, minimum wage limits and, and award wage, and things like that, they can't get jobs. And if, if we could ever get politicians who could articulate the sheer infamy of that outcome, then we might get somewhere. Thanks very much for that, that John. Um, I might address the, your first point and then I'll hand over to these guys to talk about productivity and, and um, economic growth. Uh, the reason why it's not called Target 25 or even lower is because, um, as Vakov Kaus, the, the Czech president, put it, the forces of smaller government are not currently on the winning side. Um, we're looking at a very real situation where if we continue on the way that we, we are at the moment, that we'll get to 50% of GDP. And in that sense, what we're really talking about here is two choices. You can have 30% of GDP or you can have 50% of GDP. Um, at the moment, there does not really seem to be any, any impetus for smaller government on either side of politics. And there are a lot of very serious and very challenging barriers between us and, and those sort of goals. Now, 
One of the things that we'd love to see from Target 30 is a serious discussion about the role of government in society and that once Target 30 was continued, uh, finished, that we would continue on with the sort of things that have led us to have smaller government in the first place. You know, some of the institutional changes around new spending programs so that they're independently reviewed, so that what doesn't happen is that we then go back up to 40% in another 10 years. Um, but I, I, I appreciate your point about 25% might be better and, and I mean, uh, you, it's, um, it's something that's exercised more than one person in the CIS as well. Uh, but from my perspective, I think I'd rather 30 than 50 and that's where we're headed at the moment. Um, David? In, in terms of um, productivity and labour, um, the notion in 1903, I think it was, of comparative wage justice combined with the arbitration process really set up a one-sided arrangement in which if um, a union could remain in dispute, which when you think about it, it's not very hard to do, particularly if you come from Ireland like I do, <laughs> um, then you keep getting arbitration. And arbitration uh, is, I hope there's no lawyers here, it's like spinning the chocolate wheel. If you miss first time, you make another dispute and go again. It is a horribly <coughs> adversarial way of conducting any employment process. And what we found useful at the Commonwealth Bank was to change that around and say, we stand for fair, challenging and rewarding work. That's the employer stands for that. The lawyers told us, don't do this. But we said, what, how could any person uh, require, any employee require protection from its own employer? That's an outrageous suggestion. So the way to build engagement is, to, is for employers to work by themselves towards that goal. The reason it doesn't happen often is that a lot of people in the HR process come from this legalistic background and they see HR as IR. And that, in industry, that needs to change substantially. 21 years of continuous growth is not a good background for that change to be forced upon industry, but that will change. Morris, anything to well, add? Well, of course John is right. I mean, the lower the number that government is as a percentage of the uh, of GDP, the better. Uh, there may be a level around 20%, we could argue, when we get there. But I think the other point which is being missed, it's not just the productivity of labour, it's the productivity of capital. And what we are finding now is that so much productive capital is being consumed by recurrent spending. And that is gone, it's like going on a holiday, borrowing from the bank, you've had a nice holiday, but there's no capital when you come back, you've got to pay it back. And I think this is one of the issues that is uh, likely to lead to slower growth uh, around the world because we are inexorably consuming productive capital. Moreover, if you look at what is happening particularly in Europe and the United States, we're encouraging speculation, so we're getting people out of, because there is no return on holding what we used to consider anyway, <coughs> secure assets, question whether some of these sovereign assets are secure anymore. But uh, the, we're getting people to go out along the risk curve and to the extent that we're going to go through another period like we had in 2007, 2008, again you're destroying productive capital. I think it's a very serious issue with, uh, about which very little is spoken and let alone uh, very much uh, is looked at within government. But it's as important as it is uh, having productive labour. Yep. Hi Simon, hi panel, it's uh, Julie Novak. Um, uh, the economist Peter Botka uh, has uh, on a number of occasions enunciated uh, what he would describe as a um, classical liberal policy agenda for the 21st century. Um, these broadly constitute a, a few things, but two of which would include um, an active divesture by government of roles and responsibilities to uh, business and civil society more broadly. Uh, another uh, key principle is the um, decentralisation of functions, roles and activities. 
within government that is a radical decentralization from central governments to lower levels of government. I'm particularly interested, without obviously you for telling um, what you might uh, sort of divulge in uh, future work um, under this program, I'm interested in finding out where well, you think uh, the balance might tend to lie in terms of um, actual divesture by government of functions versus a decentralization. The reason why I ask is that intriguingly in your paper, uh, you suggest um, a national health reform program. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that, Julian. I'll try and answer that very quickly and perhaps we can talk about that more later. Um, I think the answer is probably going to be both of those, those functions as you might expect. Um, one of, the th one of the problems I think we've seen in recent times is not only have we got a centralisation of functions of government um, and increasingly the Commonwealth Government is dominating all of the conversation, we've actually seen a duplication of functions at a variety of different levels. So we've got a Commonwealth Department of Education with thousands of employees and no teachers and we've got a Commonwealth Department of Health with thousands of employees and no hospitals. Um, so we would like to see and I think that's fairly consistent with a lot of what we've argued. We'd like to see the states being responsible for the state's functions and the Commonwealth for the Commonwealth functions. Um, but within that framework, we also think there's a lot of scope for the private sector to take over some of these functions and perform them more efficiently. Especially in terms of health, I think that th there's a lot of scope for private hospitals and private health insurance and, and you know, private sector funding of health to really improve um, efficiency in that level. Obviously something we could talk about a lot more, but just try and get as best we can through these questions, so. It's a, it's a powerful message that um, we're going to Helena Handcart and who we're just on the um, go back uh, sign. And it's a powerful message and I, and, I, and I believe that it's a very necessary one. My problem is, the underlying question is, what's different? I can't actually remember a time when people haven't said that government spending is too high. I can't remember a time when government spending has been efficient. If there needs to be a message, if we're going to have a program, then we need to say what's different this time and to be honest about whether there is anything different this time. It's natural. I don't go to my doctor without being told to exercise more and eat less. <coughs> I need to know if the message is any different. I always listen and it's a good message, but I need to know if it's different this time. It's very strange to hear it now because there are a number of reasons why it doesn't gel with the general perception of how we are. Commodity prices are high and we're a big mine. Unemployment is low and therefore that dreadful drag that we see in Europe of the government having to pay people not to work isn't such an issue here. The cost of capital is low, so actually to get equipment in to dig our stuff up should be cheap. There's a high Australian dollar, so when we have to import mining equipment and stuff, it should be a great time. And we have our wonderful means-tested welfare system, which is the envy of the world. So what's the problem? I believe there is a problem. I believe we need to address the question, what is different? Have the standards of public administration dropped significantly over this dreadful chart that goes up? Or is it the fact that we are now too generous in our welfare? Because if the underlying message is that we are going to pay the old less and we're going to have less for hospital, we need to say it and we need to be able to explain why that's the case. We can't soften it by saying, it, oh yes, we're just going to be more efficient, we're going to do things and that's going to solve it. Because that is, I'm sorry, with all respect, that is the underlying background, always necessary message, but what's new about it? I believe the elements that are new are the aging population and the rising healthcare costs. I believe there are really, really disturbing trends related to the change in dependency ratios, the issue of the size of population as to what we're going to do about it with issues of immigration and whatever, which really deserve focused attention, really sharp attention, which the CIS is does give, and, I'm, and it's one of the reasons I support the CIS, because we need the attention on it. But please, please, if we're going to have a program, can we please be clear what's different about the message and what really is the underlying point that we want to get over? Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, if I can answer that very, very briefly, 
Um, I think the difference about this campaign is that we are not just saying we need smaller government and government spending is too high. We're saying that we should be cutting in these specific areas and we're going to outline in a paper on welfare and a paper on health and a paper on education exactly what we mean when we say smaller government. But I think you're right and you touched on the key points there. We are looking at in the next 30 years identified in documents produced by the government by Treasury there is going to be an enormous pressure on our budgets, on our future generations, on our taxes, uh, that's going to come from an ageing population and rising healthcare costs. And it's something that, that really will impact everywhere across the world and hasn't been felt yet anywhere. Um, and it is something that will challenge Australia. You're right, Australia is in a good position compared to the rest of the world, mostly because we've avoided <laughs> some of the worst excesses that we've seen in places like Europe. But the underlying trends are still there and those future problems, they're not going to go away. The majority of increases in government spending have come from new programs. Over the last 10 years, 75% of Commonwealth government increases have come from new programs. In the future, it's the existing programs that are going to be the problem because they're going to have to deal with an enormous influx of older people with rising healthcare needs and rising healthcare costs. And it's a significant issue. Um, one Simon, could I just intervene Absolutely. just very quickly? A couple of things are different. First of all, our cousins are in serious uh, financial difficulties. Their health, uh, you were saying you go to the doctor and it tells you the same thing. Well, you now have absolutely uh, wonderful examples in Europe, in the United States, of what happens when you take these things to excess. The 11 states in the United States, there are more people dependent on welfare than there are in, in employment. The other thing is we have to stop rewarding learned helplessness. And that is what is uh, every time you look around, we feel so-called compassion for people who are struggling for whatever reason. Usually the reason is because there's, there's a uh, safety net there, which means there is no incentive to get out there and start doing some hard work. Curse, I very much agree with what you're saying. I think society would be better, the economy better, and people are happier if government was small. Nonetheless, over my professional life over the past 40 years, governments have got bigger. The reason for that is when it came to the choice, governments thought the electorates would prefer more spending and more regulation to lower taxes and lower regulation. How are you going to change their mind? <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, exactly, and I, I think Greg, Greg puts it there, hard work. Um, we're going to document as best we can what we think the outcomes will be um, and we're going to put the evidence out there and, and we're going to try and let people convince themselves of that. But importantly, I think this is a campaign. It's an ongoing campaign for smaller government. We're going to be out there talking about this again and again and again until people start getting the message. Um, it's not going to be a one-off thing where we put this out there and then we move on to something else. This is an ongoing campaign for the CIS and hopefully it's going to have the effect that we want. Can I just uh, say one thing about that question? A year and a half ago, if you look at a bar chart of government debt plus the present value of future commitments for welfare, health, age, pensions and so on, for the range of Eurozone countries in the United States, the highest on the bar chart of all of them was the United States and the United States is running a current account deficit as well. Big budget deficit, current account deficit. Europe had lower readings than the United States and had a current account in balance, thanks to Germany, of course. But the lowest on that bar chart was Spain. Can you explain to me why people in Spain have got a 50% unemployment rate for their youth? But that's not enough to get people thinking. It, we, we should not be sitting here watching that and then we, and be following the same approach to public <coughs> policy and assume we're going to be okay. Thanks, Simon. And uh, again, congratulations to CIS for uh, beginning this, this uh, program because I think it's, it's very worthwhile. I have to say, though, like John Stone, that as a former chair of the CIS, when uh, I was asked to, uh, to speak here, I never thought... I would ever support a campaign to reduce government spending uh, from 35% of GDP to under 30 in 10 years. It's just uh, extraordinary. 
But during my time in the Rolf, which was uh, in the mid-80s to uh, the, uh, the early 90s, uh, just 20 years on, government spending to GDP was as low as 22.8%. That's what it was. And I thought that was too high. But uh, here we are, 20 years on, and I think 2050, 50% is, is not a stretch at all. I mean, we've gone from 22.8 to 35% in 20 years. But that was then and this is now, and uh, unless a stand is taken to arrest this steady rise in government spending, Australia will become yet another moribund democratic socialist state, just like Britain, which is 47.3% uh, uh, government to GDP, France 52.8%, Belgium 50% and Italy 48.8%. So it's no accident that high growth countries such as China, which is a communist country, but 20.8% 20 uh, is, is the size of government to their GDP, and Singapore, which is 17% of uh, government to GDP, they do much better with smaller government because big government is inefficient. And what we know is that explicit taxation in most of the developed worlds uh, the developed economies, is only part of what makes citizens, uh, or only part of what uh, citizens are levied. Borrowings make up the rest, of course. So it is what governments spend, not what they tax, which should be the focus of economists and voters. And it is a sign of the times that since the recent UK downgrade, there are now only 11 AAA economies in the world. And three of them are on negative watch. So I think that's a pointer to the state of the world in which we live and the financial position. And if that's not a lesson to, uh, to people about where undisciplined tax, borrow and spend policies lead, I don't know how uh, one can be spelled out. In Australia, we've gone from a zero net, tax, a net debt position in 2007 to in excess of $150 billion today. That's not bad going over five years. Uh, as David said, if you look at gross debt, that's uh, obviously even higher. And while it is true that 10% debt to GDP is by today's global standards not high, it is an amount that has to be repaid or else inflated away. Ultimately, if it continues to grow unchecked, if it continues uh, to, uh, to grow, <laughs> it will call into question the capacity of today's taxpayers to discharge the debt which was largely incurred for them. And as government debt grows as a proportion of GDP and as populations age, the more likely it is that future generations will have to meet those obligations. So while perhaps not understood in these terms, future generations will be entitled to look back at their parents and their grandparents and say these people were, un were uncaring and selfish. And so they were. Now, clearly what we're seeing in Europe is a consequence of too much government. Rather than invoke the wrath of voters by taxing too much, legislators have decided to go into debt. And, of course, instead of repaying the debt, they've continued to borrow. And they've ended up in a debt trap where lenders no longer are prepared to extend credit. That, of course, slowed growth significantly and it's resulted in high levels of unemployment and the disadvantage are those who are the young and most vulnerable. So the advocates of bigger government might, tend, might care to ponder just how these policies have been caring and compassionate because the people who are the most vulnerable are the ones who are suffering the most. Now in Australia, as in the rest of the developed world, uh, there is this myth that we can all live better at the expense of everybody else. And that myth is encouraged. Voters are bribed with offers of free goods and free services. And it is essentially, it's a cargo cult mentality. And of course, it is unsustainable. Yet it is ingrained and it poses difficulties for those who are fiscally conservative who must deal with the opponents. You're seeing this already with withdrawal of the so-called kids bonus, the outcry that there is over this. So there is going to be substantial opposition when these benefits are, 
uh, going to be cut or withdrawn. And while the government will claim that the $70 billion spending spree uh, was a necessary stimulus to counter the global financial crisis, a more sober assessment will show that billions of dollars were spent simply on pet ideological projects, for which there is now little to show. That misallocation of capital, as I was saying earlier, is very costly, because to the extent that recurrent spending consumes productive capital, it also limits productivity and future growth. The challenge for the world is how to grow the economy when government is such a high proportion of GDP and when debt is so high. And it's clear from the studies of Reinhardt and Rogoff, who uh, this time it's different, and uh, a number of other studies, these are people from Princeton, obviously good economists, they are saying when government reaches a size of about 90% or debt burden approaches 90%, median growth is reduced by at least 1%. Now, Australia is far from that. I'm not suggesting the US, uh, is any, uh, that Australia is anywhere near the United States. The US debt to GDP is now 106%, and it is approaching the da danger zone where lenders start to demand a premium. And while the Fed has successfully kicked the can down the road, it should be remembered that the tepid recovery of the United States is now in its fifth year, and it is mature. So with the American economy teetering on the brink of another recession, with 50% of the world's economy in recession, and with China reverting to the mean, I think it's not unreasonable to say that Australia's terms of trade are unlikely to re reach their recent heights, and that Australia's own growth position is going to be under pressure. That said, the 10 tips to target 30, I think, are an excellent list of broad strategies to curb the growth of government and to deliver services more efficiently. However, none of this can be accomplished unless expectations can be aligned with reality and sustainability. So I think there's no doubt that the target 30 tips, the 10 tips, should be supported. But whether we end up with government at 30 or 20 per cent, I think we will still be saying, thank God we don't get all the government we pay for. Thank <laughs> you.